resume recording. Okay, brilliant. Um, hi, hello everybody and welcome to our um, Community Eye Health Journal Surgical Skills webinar. My name is Almin Wolfart and I'm the uh, Editor-in-Chief of the journal. And with me today is Will Dean and Fatima Chiari and also Oliver Kemp. Um, it's really exciting to see you here. And, uh, and this is the, the issue, this is a fantastic and really practical hands-on issue um, that this webinar is about. So I'm going to hand over to Will and Fatima in a moment. Um, I'm just before I do that, I'm going to pop a link in the chat that's um, the link tree with access to the journal in all sorts of formats. Um, and there's also going to be um, a feedback form. So I'll, I'll share that now. And as as you go and at may, hopefully at the end of the webinar, please complete that so we can see what you thought. And, and um, you know, so we have some feedback about what to do in the future. Thank you so much. I'm handing over now. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much. Uh... Elmine, and I, I wonder if you can uh, see my see my screen there. Uh, Elmine, can you see that full screen? Yes, I yes, can. Yes. Yes. Okay, great, <laughs> great. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good e good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining uh, uh, this this webinar, um, which should be about an hour uh, long. Um, hosted by London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine International Centre for Eye Health, the Community Eye Health Journal, um, about the role of surgery simulation in ophthalmology uh, training. And this is on the back of the special edition um, of the Community Eye Health Journal, uh, which was published uh, a few months ago on uh, surgical skills and uh, uh, skills in general and the role of simulation. Uh, my name is uh, Will Dean. It's lovely to see some very familiar uh, names uh, uh, who, who have joined. And uh, thank you so much for your time today in joining. Um, I, I work as a consultant in Cheltenham, uh, with special interest in uh, cataracts and glaucoma, um, and also as an assistant clinical professor at uh, LSHTM and honorary associate professor at the University of uh, Cape Town. Uh, first of all, a huge thank you to the Alverscroft Foundation, who were uh, pivotal in uh, providing uh, funds for the special edition, and we really value their support, uh, as always. Uh, also, a huge th thank you to Almin Wolfart, uh, who uh, you've just met as the editor of the Community Eye Health Journal, uh, to Hugh Bassett, who helped set up the webinar, to Professor Fatima Kiari, who is uh, joining us from Abuja, Nigeria. Uh, thank you so much, Fatima. Uh, to Mr. John Ferris and uh, to also to uh, Dr. Ollie uh, Kemp, who is moderating the questions in the chat function, um, and a fantastic uh, um, trainee from uh, from the, the UK and an ex alumni of LSHTM. Um, if you have your smartphone with you, I'd encourage you to grab the uh, camera and uh, take a photo of the QR code, uh, the scan me QR code. Uh, if you haven't already downloaded the free copy of the Community Eye Health Journal app, uh, then uh, yeah, scan that QR code and uh, a little bit later on, uh, feel free to to download the uh, download the app and see all the wonderful resources that are there. This is the cover of the Learning Surgical Skills for Eye Care a special edition, uh, which was uh, published at the end of last year. Um, and a huge thank you to all of the wonderful contributors to this uh, special edition, uh, a great wealth of expertise, and even a, a few extra articles which are online uh, on the Community Eye Health Journal uh, website and app. Um, so that for those who missed it, here's the uh, QR code to, to scan um, again, uh, and I'll come back to this a little bit later. So to kick off, um, historically, the apprentice model or the health steadian model of uh, teaching surgery was a see one, do one, teach one model uh, based on patients and invented by uh, Halstead, who interestingly also um, brought in the surgical glove. It takes a long time, uh, years and years and years, and it's very stressful, uh, stressful for the patient stressful for the trainee who's trying to learn uh, the intricacies of uh, microsurgery or surgery in a very high stakes environment. And it's very stressful for the trainer as well. Um, and with, as you can see at the bottom right, with lots of people watching over your shoulder in a very noisy high stakes environment, 
it's very, very stressful. And, and most patients, you know, don't respond well to that, that level of, of stress and are all, already anxious and, and, and just want their vision restored. Um, but the need is acute. So I'll, I'll very briefly cover some, some numbers, but you can see with the density equalized cartograms on the top left where blindness is in the world and below that where ophthalmic surgeons or ophthalmologists are. And obviously there's a disproportion, there's a mismatch there. Around 43 million people are blind in the world and nearly 300 million uh, have uh, moderate and severe vision impairments. And if you um, had to operate on all people with less than um, 618 uh, vision from cataract, then a huge number of cataract operations would need to be uh, performed. Um, millions over uh, the next uh, year, just to clear the backlog. Um, India has amongst the highest uh, cataract surgical rate globally at, at over 6 million. If you look at the number of ophthalmologists worldwide at 230,000, Greece has probably the highest proportion per million at 182. Um, and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, it, it varies di in different countries, um, but runs at about 2.25 to 2.7 ophthalmologists per million. Globally, there's a, a huge need to increase and improve surgical training, and especially cataract surgical training. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the median number of cataract surgeries performed by ophthalmology res residents by year two of the training was zero. And in mainland China, um, the median number of cataract surgeries uh, performed by senior trainees at the end of their three years training also was zero. Um, in India, the median number of cataract surgeries performed independently during training residency was, as you can see, one FACO, 55 SICS and 18 um, Ekis. So small numbers. So there's, there's a real need to increase and improve um, training. Um, so is there a role for surgery simulation in ophthalmology training? And I'd love to say yes. Um, but before we, we dive into it, um, what simulation is not is a replacement for uh, ongoing live surgical education and training. And simulation is not a one size fits all silver bullet. So there's no perfect simulation model. And simulation in itself is not a surrogate. It's not a replacement for personal individual motivation and self-driven participation. And we'll come around to this uh, with a discussion from uh, John Ferris. Um, uh, and simulation is also not just the, merely the presence of a wet lab. Um, and um, although that can be a very important part um, of providing access to a simulation. And we'll be hearing from Prof Kiari with her fantastic work at Symbolab in, uh, in Nigeria. If you look at these two videos, this was a, um, a novice cataract surgeon who was a participant in the Olympics trial. And on the left, um, they were, they'd seen an M6 uh, manual small incision cataract procedure, and they were trying to perform it after having seen it once or twice. And you can see that that's on the bottom left, not an ideal scleral tunnel. It's looking a little bit dangerous. On the right is exactly the same trainee surgeon performing a M6 procedure after four and a half days of intense simulation-based surgical training. And you can see an incredible difference in the level of performance, in the level of competence. And the question would be, well, as a trainee, would, when would you prefer to go for live surgical training? And as a trainer, uh, which would you prefer to take to theatre to start live surgical training on, on patients? And obviously the, the, the answer I guess is fairly self-evident. Um, so simulation skill centers, we'll cover this in quite detail. Um, it, just to explain that simulation-based surgical education is not just the presence of a wet lab or dry lab or a simulation skill center. Um, there are numerous models um, available um, and 
on the on the lower line as well, numerous high tech models, including on the bottom left, the eyes eye simulator. Second from the bottom right is the help me see. And, and on the far bottom right is the Orbis International um, a VR fundamental uh, M6 simulator in development. Um, so there's lots of different types of simulation. However, all of these aspects are needed for simulation in surgical education to work. There needs to be a skills acquisition and maintenance. There needs to be feedback on that um, skills acquisition. Participants need to engage in a sustained deliberate practice. There needs to be a curriculum and curriculum integration. There needs to be an outcome measurement. The simulation needs appropriate fidelity. And then need, you need to be able to transfer that to practice. You can engage in team training and instructor training, and there needs to be educational and professional context. I would add to that list that two of the most important aspects of simulation in surgical education to make it impactful is reflective learning and motivation or self-motivation. Um, if you can record your performance in simulation as well as later on in live surgery and then watch your performance back and be your own best critic and engage in reflective learning it is an exceptionally powerful tool uh, assuming that you then take your reflections and improve in your performance subsequently and that leads on to the motivation you have to want to be a better surgeon or a better practitioner a better clinician um, Professor Roger Kneebone um, stated that simulation offers an environment in which learners can train until they reach specified levels of competency. And that is so key. Um, simulation also offers uh, patient safety uh, improvements. Um, access to simulator reduces the rates of um, posterior capsule rupture. And we proved that also in the Olympics trial. And these were two of the seminal papers from John Ferris um, and the NOD database and uh, Peace uh, Staropoli. Um, there are further potential uh, uses of simulation in ophthalmic education, and that's the initial uh, technique learning skills, uh, practicing rare complications or rarer complications, potentially returning to surgical practice over a period of absence, whether it's uh, maternity or paternity leave or illness or injury. Uh, a non-clinical academic sabbatical or even the, uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, there's potential in maintenance of skills as well as, interestingly, in assessment um, as well as team training. Um, for the initial technique skills learning of a particular procedure, um, simulation-based surgical education is, is um, based at taking a novice trainee at the bottom through the stage of advanced beginner to competent. Now, we recognize that proficiency or expertise, that's only gained over many months, years in a live surgical environment. Um, so this was one approach that we had. Um, again, a bit of repetition, but just to break this down. So we just deconstruct a surgical technique. So that could be corneal suturing. It could be squint surgery. It could be cataract surgery. We provide instruction and then feedback and enable the participant to engage in sustained deliberate practice. So that's practicing a particular part of a technique again and again and again, but to a very um, deliberate um, um, outcome. Reflective learning, as I said, was really important as is outcome assessment and fidelity and motivation. So for example, um, sutureless um, ECI or a small incision cataract surgery, you can deconstruct um, the procedure to all of its steps, um, provide instruction, provide feedback, engage in sustained deliberate practice again and again and again. Uh, here you can see um, the Oscar, um, the uh, red, yellow, and green uh, assessment rubrics being used um, while the procedure is being recorded on an iPad. You can use any smartphone as well. The outcomes assessment, here's an example of the... Um, ophthalmic simulated surgical competency assessment rubric, a fantastic tool available in lots of different procedures to enable you to um, watch your recording and reflect on your performance, score yourself, be your own um, critic, and then go back and improve your performance next time.
Obviously, you need fidelity, but it doesn't need to be the highest end computerized, um, very expensive uh, fidelity. And we'll come on to that. As I mentioned, you have to want to be a better surgeon, and that's where motivation comes in. So, again, if simulation, intense simulation can bring the trainee from the left to a performance on the bottom right within four days, albeit very intense, then obviously there is an important role. So we, we took that approach um, to uh, a randomized controlled trial level. And we, um, through the London School of Hydrogen Tropical Medicine, under the supervision of Pro Professor Matthew Burton um, and the collaboration of uh, fantastic teams in uh, Nairobi, Uganda, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe in South Africa, um, conducted the Olympics trial, which was the Ophthalmic Learning and Improvement Initiative in Cataract Surgery Randomized Control Trials. And uh, 52 participants were assessed for eligibility and 50 were enrol enrol en enrolled. These were all novice cataract surgeons. They were randomized um, to uh, intervention and control groups. And uh, the analysis was conducted on an intention to treat uh, basis. Three video recordings of the SICS cataract procedure was conducted for each of the participants at baseline. Um, and then the intervention group had the intervention of that intense simulation-based surgical training for M6. Uh, the control group carried on with standard uh, training. And at three months, a further three video recordings assessments were made. And again, at 12 months, at one year. Following the 12 months assessment, the control participants um, uh, were involved in an intense four-day training. And then a final assessment was made at 15 months. And this is the result of the Olympic trial RCT. And I'm just drilling down into this because it's important that we now have randomized control trial level evidence of the utility of simulation-based training for um, uh, surgical education in, um, in ophthalmology, in cataract and glaucoma surgery. We can see here are the results of the Olympics trial. The blue line um, is the intervention group and the baseline scores are about 25% to 27%. And those scores they treble after the intervention of the blue line. And that blue line then stays for the whole one year. The level of competence stays. The orange line, um, competence slowly increases until the one year mark. And then again, it jumps um, after that, that orange arrow of the intervention. Confidence, self-reported confidence scores also trebled. Um, and uh, participants went on to perform more surgeries in the year after training. Importantly, complication rates reduced by 72% in the one year of live surgeries following the intense um, simulation-based training. A very similar methodology was used for the GLASS, the glaucoma simulator surgery trial. These were slightly more senior trainees, but they were novice to trabeculectomy surgery. And again, trabeculectomies were performed three times at baseline for each of the participants. And then the intervention group had the intense four day course of trabeculectomy simulation training. And then the, the primary outcome at three months assessments. And then again, secondary at 12 months, then the control participants uh, had the same training course. This is an example of uh, part of the training, um, a very uh, elegant article by Porteus using uh, cellophane and an apple for practicing a trabeculectomy flap. Um, this is the results of the GLASS trial. And again, you can see scores of a trabeculectomy at baseline, the bottom left there, of uh, less than 25%, about 22%. And those scores trebled in the blue line after the intervention. And th that level of competence stayed for the entire year. And uh, competence in the orange line barely increased. And then after the intervention, at, after the one year assessment, again, nearly trebled. Um, so this is the impact of um, simulation training, uh, albeit in an intense environment. Competence scores also increased and participants went on to perform a huge number more um, trabeculectomies in the year after training. We've developed this now. Um, or, uh, there's been numerous developments of using 
uh, remote uh, digital dry labs and web labs. Um, and there is a, a network now of um, uh, um, surgical training centers and uh, uh, um, dry labs, web labs um, throughout um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, um, including uh, University of Cape Town, Cameroon, and Nairobi, uh, Kigali, Tanzania, uh, Lomé, Mbarara, and also now uh, in Abuja, in Nigeria, where Professor uh, Kiari will be uh, talking to us from. Um, more recently, we've also started um, FACO training at the University of Cape Town. Similar approach has been used in Honduras by the Advanced Center for um, Eye Care Global, where they have a live surgical streaming uh, from mentor to learner um, that you can see, see going on here. Uh, this is the uh, fairly straightforward um, setup that they had for the live surgical streaming. And um, Sunil Mamtora has uh, been instrumental in piloting this um, in, in the UK and um, globally as well. Um, here you can see the, the views on the laptops and uh, they used multiple cameras to create a virtual um, operating room, a virtual theater. Um, the live surgical streaming uh, allowed for more frequent mentoring encounters during the normal um, theater flow. It stimulates the relationship uh, development. It was a safe learning environment for young surgeons early in their surgical experience and allowed for uh, real-time dialogue. And they've developed, obviously, wet labs um, as well and now live streaming simulation um, of, uh, of, of within the wet labs. And this was indeed discussed in the um, surgical um, uh, special edition of the uh, Community Eye Health Journal, um, where the low cost remote wet lab uh, model was developed at Alvi Prasad, um, a great article by um, the, the team in, in LV. Um, so just to recap, the simulation in surgical training is not just having a wet lab. Um, all of these uh, aspects need to be built in for it to be effective. Saying that, though, it is possible to engage in simulation training um, in all of these um, skills and many others on your own. And this is a trabeculectomy flap that we previously showed. Here's a, um, a, a small short video which shows the basics of uh, the scleral flap, some of the principles, and then a demonstration of what is needed. An apple, some micronotched tooth forceps, but micronotched forceps. Straight sutures, a or sutures, blade, super sharp blade, and a crescent blade, fifteen degree blade and crescent blade, and a pattern, a scleral flap. So I'm going to initially so draw, draw my a limbus, limbus. Um, and any size around about a, a centimeter. And doesn't need to be too big. It's fine. You can make it a little bit bigger, a little bit shine like that, but, but a decent, uh, your initial flap will be about in So drawing the dimensions of the initial flap. A very, and then millimeters. Again, uh, using uh, the 15 degree blade to create the initial scleral incision of the flap. I'll use my crescent blade. And then using the crescent blade to, to mine the incision of the now create the flap. flap. And it's a very, Control so this is a very effective, movement. very affordable, simple way right. of so learning and practicing the trabeculectomy flap. This is quite a tricky maneuver to... And practice completion the... of the flap as well. The idea is to get it correct and accurate as many times as possible. And you can imagine on that particular apple, you could perform 20, 30 flaps and buy a bag of apples and perform as many flaps as, as, as you'd like. Similarly, for a scleral tunnel for uh, manual small incision cataract surgery, here you see um, some scleral fixation forceps. And again, you can use a pen if you like, or here we're going straight in with the 15 degree super sharp blade, performing the uh, initial frown shaped incision 
of the um, M6 procedure of the scleral tunnel, and then the crescent um, blade to create that scleral tunnel. It's very easy to buttonhole an apple uh, skin, but the fidelity of this is, is incredibly good. Um, and again, if you can practice this on an apple a hundred times or more, it will ex exponentially improve your performance in, in surgery. Um, and a, a fantastic senior trainee uh, in, in Bristol, Rebecca Jones, uh, prepared this article on uh, basic microsurgical suturing. And uh, you can see on the right, all the different steps of practicing uh, corneal suturing on uh, relatively uh, you know, cheap or, or used artificial eyes. Um, and again, you can see in figure one, there's only a very basic set of instruments um, that are needed um, to, to practice basic microsurgical uh, skills, um, suturing and corneal suturing. Uh, Jackie Newton, fantastic um, staff nurse from uh, the uh, Flying Eye Hospital of Orbis International, and Rebecca again prepared this uh, lovely article on passing sutures. So getting down into a little bit more detail, but again, you can you can practice this with a very simple setup um, with minimal instrumentation and e even use sutures and and a, and a piece of foam. Um, and you can practice it again and again away from Ready away from patients. Using a ten oh nine and here a we'll see or a bit of background on releasable sutures. Eight oh nine on ten oh and we'll, again we'll practice this needle holder needle holder pair of suture ties suture tying forceps these are just some scissors we have uh, again keep we'll draw our limbus. Keep it, keep it fairly weak. So we create our flap. And final little thing here, you can again use this blade, or if you fairly have carefully, if you can, fifteen degree blade. Um, I'm just going to make. And once you've created your flap, precision suture. You pick, it up third, pick up your suture, yeah. and you can accurately practice your releasable okay. sutures um, there. Back again, again. It's now towards the corner. So of this the is quite an intricate part of the glaucoma uh, surgery procedure. Um, within a trabeculectomy. And if you can practice this on a piece of foam away from patients in a calm environment um, it's numerous times, dozens of times, then your, your surgical um, safety and uh, uh, competence will, will go through the roof. So those are just a few examples of what can be practiced. And we'll cover a couple more, but, but also to cover the resources that are available. And there's a fantastic website, simulatedoculosurgery.com, um, which was developed by uh, John Ferris, who uh, will be chatting with John Ferris, who's a consultant ophthalmologist uh, based in the UK, who's also a trustee of Orbis International and a global leader in ophthalmic uh, surgical training and specifically uh, simulator surgical training, and the owner and developer and creator of the uh, well known website, Simulated Ocular Surgery. Thank you, John. Will, thank you very much for asking me to make a small contribution to what sounds like an amazing uh, webinar uh, following on from the uh, journal that uh, featured lots of fantastic topics on simulated uh, surgery and simulated skills and ophthalmology in general. Uh, I really want to talk about uh, the fact that simulation does not have to be high tech nor expensive. It can be very, very simple and accessible. Uh, and Acquiring surgical skills does not Well, I can't hear him now. Rebecca Jones, one of our fantastic trainees in uh, the southwest of England that we presented at the APOS meeting, the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus in New York last year. Uh, and the basis of this was we wanted to try and work out if novice surgeons who'd never even seen a strabismus operation, could learn the basic building blocks of strabismus surgery with no uh, access to a virtual or a face-to-face -face surgical tutor. So the model eyes are very, very simple. And Will will show you a video after I've finished talking here of how to take half a ping pong ball, some foam and some sellotape uh, and uh, some modeling clay 
and to make a model which allows you to practice these basic building blocks of strabismus surgery. So instrument handling, how to pick up a needle, how to make a safe scleral pass with some 6 ovicral, how to tie a surgical knot, and how to secure a rectus muscle on that 6 suture. So we asked the trainees to watch the video on simulated ocular surgery of Rebecca performing this procedure on the Model I. Watch it once, record their practice with their mobile phone. And then to continue for the next week, watching the video, practicing until they were happy that they had achieved a level of competence similar to that displayed in the video. I then blindly scored their first video and their last video. And most people using our little modified matrix, which is the total points of eight, were scoring one, two, or maybe three out of eight for their initial uh, practice but all of the trainees managed a score of seven or eight at the end of a week's practice. So in other words, they'd acquired the basic skills required to start live surgery safely under supervision. And that's with absolutely no uh, direct training, just watching the videos. I then did a follow-up virtual one-on-one -on -one, uh, 15 minute teaching session with them. And there really was very little that I had to add or to modify uh, in that, that session. So this proved that if you're in a part of the world where you don't have access to a trainer or fancy model eyes, you can actually make a very simple model and pick up these microsurgical skills yourself uh, and become you know, competent to a level where you're ready to commence live surgery. And that same could be done for parts of cataract surgery, capsular rectus, corneal incisions, corneal suturing. In a microsurgical setting where you have a STEMI microscope linked to an iPad or a phone, you, again, you can record your practice. Um, and I think that's incredibly valuable uh, and prove what we all thought would be the case, that you can actually teach yourself a lot of surgical skills without having to rely on a, a, a mentor. Um, and we got a lot of interest at the, the, at the conference. And I think a lot of hopefully relevance to people watching the webinar today. And Will's going to show you now a little video of the Model I, uh, and you'll see how simple it is to make it and use it yourselves. I hope you find that helpful. Brilliant. So thank you, John. Um, I'll show you this brief video here. Snake. I'm it's not sure if the volume's are okay. All you'll need to make this model is one millimeter thickness modeling foam, ping pong ball cut in half, some tape, and matchsticks or some wood. Very you basic kit. Making square passes of the correct depth. Oven hardening modeling clay can also be used, but it's not essential. To practice your square passes and muscle surgery, you'll also need a pair of suture tires, Westcott scissors, and Moorfields and St. Martin's forceps. The ideal suture to use is a 6 0 on an 8 millimeter spatulated needle. So you can see how your model it's very eye, basic. Cut the modeling clay and cut into a strip. Cut your 1 millimeter foam into a strip, roughly 2 by 13 centimeters, with your limbus drawn on. Cover the ball with the modeling clay and then layer over the foam. Stick down with the tape, trying to keep the foam as taut as possible. Now you can practice scleral sutures. Holding the needle one third down the body and with the tip horizontal, press downwards to engage the sclera. Too superficial and you'll only engage conjunctiva and tenons, and in the model eye the foam will just tear through. Keep pushing down as you rotate your wrist and tunnel through before remounting the needle, ready for your next pass. If you hold the needle too far down at the swage, you'll have poor control of the needle pass. If you angle the needle tip down, you risk perforating the sclera and damaging the retina. To check if you've made any suture passes too deep, check the modeling clay. Any scleral perforations will be obvious. You can also practice reverse mounting your needle and trying reverse needle passes. So that it, it's Today a, I will show you how to... It's a fantastic model that you can also then use uh, to practice um, uh, muscle resection, um, which um, Rebecca, again, Just is demonstrating. Mark. Pull the suture through, leaving a short end. Then make a second full thickness bite, bringing the suture underneath the needle to lift it up and make it easier to regrasp. You can practice this again and again. And th these videos, these fantastic videos um, from uh, Rebecca throw, Jones and John Perez, they're available or on the simulated throw. ocular surgery uh, website. Um, talking of ping pong balls, um, as part of the um, uh, special edition journal 
um, uh, um, there was a great article by James Rice and John L. Steffen of using a ping pong ball model uh, to practice uh, viewing um, and uh, of uh, during vitro retinal surgery. You can see the bottom left uh, with the pupil and port sites, um, and then they further used um, a used advanced uh, model eye to practice indentation. Um, and these are these are really fantastic, innovative ways of using a low cost um, and innovative simulation. Uh, CyberSight is also a fantastic resource. So cybersight.org um, has a huge number of educational resources. But if you go onto their website and you go to the search function, uh, you can search simulation. And there's a number of surgical and other simulation um, resources available, a really, really valuable resource. Um, uh, Ivor Ferreira uh, has set up and uh, run this in incredible unit of Oftalmo University uh, in uh, Mexico. And again, you can go onto their website, uh, ophthalmouniversity.com, um, and they have uh, a Cataract Advanced uh, uh, um, courses, as well as the basic academy course and lots of other really, really good resources to help you become the surgeon you want to be. Um, taking this sort of a step further, we've developed a, uh, a manual of setting up a simulation uh, surgery training unit, um, which details uh, some of the more advanced equipment that can be used, including the STEMI 305 microscopes uh, built into a digital classroom and what instruments you might need um, within that, we also look at uh, the rooms, uh, the screens, microscopes, instruments, um, and different types of consumables that you might um, want to consider, and what courses you could develop, as well as obviously further resources. There's a number of checklists, including equipment, uh, instruments that you might want to consider, uh, consumables, and just quickly coming back to instruments, you can obviously use single use instruments. Um, which in, in a simulation uh, skills lab, you can use again and again, uh, different consumables and other educational materials. And any basic classroom could be used. And this is an example of um, a single state, single station um, setup um, where the STEMI microscope is unboxed um, and then put together um, and it, it's fairly straightforward. Um, and, and this is how it looks with the instruments and everything all set up. Um, once again, this is um, a setting up at the University of Nairobi um, for assessments, and it is a, a fairly straightforward setup. Um, it doesn't really need much IT um, or, or, or too much um, uh, uh, time to, to put together. Um, Four, uh, four station classroom setup, likewise. Um, uh, you, you can then link all of these microscopes through a router to a local area network, and then, then they can be linked into an iPad um, where you can record your performance. And as we, we see here uh, with the two iPads recording the trabecular me, uh, performance. Um, Amelia Geary and the team at Orbis um, took this to the next level and developed a very detailed simulation center manual, um, which you can download for free uh, from the Orbis uh, CyberSite uh, website. And you can see the link, uh, the link there. Um, the, the team at Aravind also um, published in the a special edition of the journal. And you can see here some of their fantastic innovations in their website and the live surgical training at Aravind uh, Eye Hospitals, including their uh, thoughts on setting up uh, the wet lab uh, and other ways to practice. Uh, really, really great, great article. Um, so the, lots of different types of simulation, um, apples, foam, um, are, are, are excellent fidelity for, for learning lots of different parts of uh, a procedure. They, you don't need to rely on fancy model eyes, although they can, you know, they have fantastic fidelity for practicing a full procedure and, and are incredibly useful. And again, down at the bottom, 
the eyes eye and help me see simulators they they are um expensive um so there's a cost involved with that but they do also have you know a, a, a really good place if they are available this is the eyes eye surgical simulator for uh, phaco emulsification uh, and vitreo retinal um, surgery which is a high-end virtual reality simulator for intraocular surgical training and we have recently installed uh, one of these um, in the University of Cape Town and courses are now offered for phaco emulsification uh, cataract surgery as well as vitrectomy and basic microsurgical skills, uh, trabeculectomy and manual small incision cataract surgery, a really lovely addition there. The Help Me See platform courses are available in M6, FACO, Complications and Suturing as well in the US and France and Mexico, Madagascar, India and China. And this is they offer a, a really comprehensive four day virtual reality uh, simulation training course uh, where uh, trainees receive lots of hours of practice on the Help Me See simulator. And uh, the course covers all steps required to complete the procedure. And there's a really good interactive M6 ebook. Um, and uh, Charles um, and Ashke uh, actually uh, gave a really, really nice summary of this um, in the in the journal um, as well. So huge thanks to them. Um, once again, this was the journal article. And so if you have your iPhone, uh, your smartphone ready, then do feel free to scan that, uh, take a photo of that QR code uh, and download the Community Eye Health Journal app. Um, and then just to finish off, I'd, I'd want to say that, you know, this old apprentice model of teaching surgery of see one, do one, teach one on live patients. Yes, it does take a long time. And yes, it is very stressful for everyone. And we should be replacing this with a simulation model, uh, model for learning and teaching surgery where you see one, do a hundred in simulation and then record your performance or performances and uh, reflect and improve. It takes some time, but it's not stressful. It's safe, it's highly effective, and it's affordable. Um, so a huge thank you very much for your very kind attention. Once again, that QR code uh, is down the uh, bottom there if you want to take a photograph of that and download the Community Eye Health Journal app. Um, otherwise, I will stop sharing my screen. And um, Fatima, can I please hand over to you? Um, thank you very much. Thank you all. Hi, Fatima. We look forward to hearing from you. Hello. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much for this presentation. I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see it? That looks great, Fatima. Yeah. OK. Um, I have my eye on the time, so I'm going to be quite quick. I just wanted to share our experiences with the glass training that we had in Abuja. Um, I was privileged to be part of the Nairobi 2019 and um, training as a facilitator. And when I saw that, I thought, yeah, we could do that in Abuja as well. And um, of course, I don't want to say too much about the background because um, Will has already highlighted that we need to be proficient in trabeculectomy because it is the choice in advanced glaucoma. Um, most surgeons, most ophthalmic surgeons in Nigeria don't really perform trabeculectomy. And there's a drive towards subspecialization for glaucoma. So it's kind of leaves the traps to the subspecialists. Um, before we went, before we did the glass, we actually did a survey. I'll just whiz through this. Um, most of the respondents were residents, doctors, they were not really satisfied with the ophthalmic surgical training they obtained for trabeculectomy. And they were not quite happy with their proficiency in performing trabeculectomy. And um, they did not really engage with their teaching skills labs in their institutions. So these were the challenges. And we now felt that it was you know, time to go along the same lab way so that we would um, focus on their training. And certainly 99% of the respondents wanted to have a SIM-based surgical training. 
and um, they felt that it would increase their proficiency and it would enhance the surgeon's confidence and improved patient safety. So we had the first glass training in 2023 in Nigeria. As Will said, you know, it's a very um, simple thing to set up. Well, not very simple, but great support. So we had a room. Fortunately, we already had a room that was outlined. This was how it looks like, different corners. And then by the time we set it up and integrated it into a digital classroom with the um, the surgical, the simulation-based microscope, which are integrated, and you can see that it's um, also internet connected. So we had the first training. I'd like to acknowledge all the partners that we that were engaged. The University of Abuja was immensely helpful because um, funds came through. The Glaucoma Society of Nigeria was the greatest technical support for that. Um, the International Center for Eye Health under the Glaucoma Net, as well as facilitating all the connections with the glass. And then um, Alvis Croft Foundation, donated the materials and site savers run the program in Nigeria. So it was it was really, you know, an interconnected partnership, which was great. Um, we we had trainer participants. I will just um, whisk through this. But the interesting thing is uh, we were able to gather trainers from different parts of the country and the world. And we had also an international faculty. We went by the rules of the SIM including the um, Oscar, um, you know, and we build it on previous experiences as well. It was quite interesting because at the same time, there was another same um, surgical training going on at Addis Ababa, Ethiopia at the same time. So we also engaged with them. So we had a blended course. Ours was, we had a blended course like two and a half weeks before the actual um, surgical course in the labs and that was really helpful because we we engaged with the cybersite.com iop.vision which was um, access given to us for free by Peter Shah and for all the participants that were whether virtual participants or you know in on site during the course so we had that also and um, I'm also looking forward perhaps for the next course will have access to simulation oculussurgery.com hopefully. Um, so we did this and this was how we did. So we had a flipped classroom method. We had so much didactic sessions, structured surgical and clinical training. So we didn't just rest on the surgery. We also did pre-op assessments, counseling, talking to the patient, post-op assessments as well. And the feedback was great. You know, um, they said we demystified the surgery, the difficult steps, especially with the suturing and the um, pre-placed sutures. And it actually motivated um, the participants to do trabeculectomy, um, improved surgical proficiency, glaucoma management, risk assessment protocol, post-op management of tra tra trabeculectomy. So I just wanted this picture for you to look slightly closely. Um, this was Kate giving instruction while she was in the UK. And so we integrated with um, our digital classroom quite well. And the recommendations, you know, we're going to put it into for the next training. Uh, well, we're putting them recommendations little by little, surgical education, rotational surgical training, and um, enhanced collaborations. So our next class training is going to be in a few weeks time in Abuja, July. We're going. We're about starting the online pre-surgical meetings and um, the Nigeria Glaucoma Toolkit training will follow that. Yeah, so uh, this is the technical team for the Glaucoma Network. If you'd like to know more about glass training as well as more about the glaucoma network you can scan the barcode as you can see it will take you to the glaucoma network website and um, you can engage with it uh, send any um, information you'd like to ask 
and we will respond. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Fatima, thank you so much. Will, thank you both so much for really insightful and helpful talks. Um, we've got some questions in the chat and comments in the chat. Um, if anybody would like to, um, you know, ask a question, I think you can put your hand up. Um, let me see how how that works. Ollie, if you want to jump in and give me a hand, that would be great. But yeah, huge, huge, huge thank yes, you. This is so interesting. There, there should yeah. be a way to, to ask questions through the uh, Q&A uh, function. Yeah. I think we've got the first question One, yes. uh, during the talk from uh, uh, Helen Roberts, who asked, uh, where do we obtain artificial eyes when we run out of apples? Um, which I think is, is a good point. You know, uh, as discussed, there's lots of opportunities to, to create your own um, uh, high fidelity simulation models and um, uh, there's some excellent resources online to, to, to find to uh, to give advice but if you don't have those materials there's a good opportunity to kind of be creative and, and create yours based off those models you don't always get an opportunity to be creative as doctors so maybe this is a bit of arts and crafts uh, that's available um do we have any other questions in the chat I think just to quickly, sorry, Ollie, just to quickly jump in there. Um, hi, Helen, lovely to see you. Um, and I think it, it is a, it is a good question. As much as you can practice steps of a procedure with, you know, as as Ollie was saying, uh, um, with innovative um, ways around. But sometimes it is best to practice the full procedure with a good high fidelity model eye. And I appreciate there is a cost involved, but actually, if you've practiced parts of this scleral tunnel, for example, 100, 150 times on apples, parts of the procedure on other materials, then you only need two artificial eyes per trainee on, on a course, May, maybe three at tops. Um, and a fast, I'm not sure your experience with the glass training as well, how many sort of model eyes uh, you need, you know, towards the end of the course for the trainees to put the whole procedure together. Um, but Helen, you can always email me. Sorry. Um, um, we I don't really have the numbers really. We just make do with what we have. Yeah. So <laughs> we're trying to. I know that one I one I does about four traps. Right. But you see, because because we're also doing um suturing with yeah. foam and other stuff like that. So I I can't really tell how many eyes. We just go with what we have. Yeah. One of our participants um, said that the, the website uh, was blocked for them in their country. Um, I was just wondering if there's an email address that they could reach out to. There's a web form. I had a quick look on the website, so you can fill in a web form. But if, if the site's blocked, then that wouldn't really help. So um, do you have any, I mean, if, you, if you've got contacts there, maybe we could share the, that email address with our participants later. Yeah, absolutely. So if if you're struggling if you're struggling to get uh, onto any of the resources that um, we we've, we've seen today, then please do feel free to to email me. I'll pop my email in the in the web chat here. Um, thank you. That's right. Hello, everyone. Hi, Nelson. Hi, Nelson. Yes, Fatma. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Although. I caught it in the way I joined late. I had very bad timing on this session. I'm really sad on that. But I first I wanted to ask if the session was recorded and maybe a little bit of introduction. My name is uh, Dr. Nelson uh, Swai from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, from Muhimbil. William Dean must be very familiar with Muhimbil. We are really thankful for his donation that enabled us to establish a wet lab here. It has been really helpful for us, the residents and even the faculty in terms of improving our skills. Brilliant. I might have a lot of questions, but may not be relevant because I was not present on the talk. What I already request is for the record tape for this session so that I can be on board. Probably the other sessions will come on the same. But otherwise, thank you very much, Dr. William, for what you have done here. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you, Nelson.
Thank you. And I can, I'm happy to say, if you would you just mute. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to say that the session is being recorded and everybody who signed up for the session will receive an email with the webinar recording and we're also going to host the recording on the on the website so there'll, there'll be a link to, it, to the recording so if you visit um, the Community Our Health Journal in a couple of weeks you should be able to see it there. Any other questions? We've got a few minutes left, so it's your chance to um, to put your hand up and, and let us know if there's anything more you would like to ask these wonderful people. Thank you everybody so much for your time, that you were, you know, take time out from your very busy schedules, both to attend and to um, and to present as well. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Elmine. I've also- I just wanted to also um, mention, someone was talking about, you know, Trab, trab, we know like it's really the end stage, right? Uh, the end of the tunnel, but whether we're addressing other issues, I think um, we're addressing patient understanding, patient awareness, you know, before even vision loss. So um, I just wanted to highlight that patient awareness and more understanding of patients, um, the, the, the natural history for glaucoma. So I'll just like to direct them to the toolkit for glaucoma management in sub-Saharan Africa and also the one that has been adapted um, by Nigeria. So it talks about other aspects, not just surgical management of glaucoma. Yeah. So, Fatima, you've popped that into the chat or will you put that into the chat? <laughs> <laughs> yes, let me find let me find the link and pop it in. <laughs> All right. We yeah. won't we won't end the webinar before you've you've had a chance to put that in for us. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got a question from Gideon asking uh, you would like to get more skills in small incision cataract surgery. Well, do you have any suggestions for um, you know maybe in addition to what you or maybe just a, a recap of what you've covered that's particularly re relevant to um, small incision cataract surgery? So I, th I think there, there's some fantastic resources available um, on the uh, internet already. Uh, CyberSight has an incredibly comprehensive nine hour course for manual small incision cataract surgery. Um, SimulatedOcularSurgery.com covers a couple of the steps um, and it's worthwhile watching these, um, these videos um, and these sources as well. I'll pop in the chat function a, a 52 minute um, a uh, recording of uh, going through the whole procedure, start to finish. Um, and then, of course, um, if you can watch those uh, videos and then practice parts of the procedure as best as you can in, in your setting, then you'll be well placed to, to start um, live surgical training under supervision. And courses are available um, with some scholarships also available at the Community Eye Health Institute at the University of Cape Town, as well as other areas as well. So there are more advanced courses available. I'll pop that in the chat function now. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. I'm just looking to see if there's a few other, um, there's a few things in the chat function, not so much as Q&A. Um, um, I'm, I'm not a surgeon, but I am a musician and I like to learn playing, you know, to play the guitar and play the piano. Um, and I know practice makes perfect. So how how often do you guys, you know, when you when you when you were starting to learn, do you do you practice every day? Do you encourage people to practice every day, or is there sort of a you know minimum of three days a week? And you know, to really to really, especially if you're learning a new skill, how how much time should you be putting in? So it's it's it, that's a really good question, and Ollie might uh, want to comment on this as well. It's I'm not sure if it's necessarily a question of time or numbers. It's a question of competence and mm -hmm. how you feel about your competence. So the, the the difference between an amateur and a professional, whether that's an amateur musician or a professional musician or a footballer or a, or a chef, um, an amateur will practice something uh, enough so that they can get it right. Uh, a professional will practice something so many times that they can't get it wrong. And... And that's that's true of surgical skills, microsurgical skills as well. So if you if you practice 50, 70, 80 scleral flaps on an apple, 
And then you, you literally just can't get it wrong. You're getting it the perfect shape, the perfect size each and every time. Then you're competent. Then thumbs up, crack on. If, if you need a whole box of apples, um, then you might need. But, but the, the, the baseline I think we found certainly in the Olympics and the glass trial was four days of intense simulation training was certainly enough for a whole procedure. But that was very intense training. Uh, what Rebecca Jones and John Ferris found in their study on um, uh, squint surgery was that it took about a week as well of repetitive watching the video, practicing, recording yourself with the iPhone, uh, watching your performance back, and then going back and repeating it over a, a good few times, an hour or two a day, hour a day over, over a week. But but we appreciate that people have very busy timetables. Uh, so if you're doing it on your own, it may take a little bit longer. Um, Brilliant. Well, those are really, really good take-home yeah. messages. Golly, yeah. I would, I would say, um, as a as a training surgeon as well, I would advocate one particular part of this whole model that you might that I found personally that you wouldn't get so much in live surgery is the kind of reflective aspect of yeah. it. So it encourages you to actually reflect and watch back and do um, monitor how you're doing. Whereas often in the in a, a theatre setting, there's very limited time between cases. You've got to do the administration of getting the patients through. You don't have a lot of time to actually reflect on how you've performed in your previous cases and what you're going to take to the next one. So having more of a kind of um, composed environment is is very helpful at the at least at the early stages of of training certainly. Yeah, sounds like it's it's the quality and it's the, it's the really noticing how well you're doing and building on that and um, unfortunately our time is up it's three minutes past three here in the uk it's been a fantastic web and i wish we'd had more time um we're probably going to have more surgical skills articles coming up in the journal i've already got a few ideas i'd love to write to to our presenters and ask them to submit some more articles if you as our um, attendees if you've got some articles you would like to submit to us please get in touch with the journal all our details are on the website um, we'd love to hear from you and please do also complete the feedback form uh, so we can tell our lovely funders um, how much you've enjoyed it and what's worked and what wasn't what hasn't worked and so that we can keep improving what we do we also want to keep learning and improving um, so thank you everybody for coming and um, and goodbye thank you especially Very to our much. presenters Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Omi. Bye. Bye.